Good morning and good day to everyone. It's good to be back here in America this evening and talking with you about the uh, the things of the Lord. And we have been on the book of Revelation. I'm going to turn on just a little bit of music for a minute or so and um, give everyone a chance to uh, come on before we begin our talk. So enjoy this little piece. <clears throat> Amen. That's uh, that's the requisite of the Pisces age, and we came out of it, and we should be very strong in only believing all things are possible, only believe. So, my name is Don Parnell, and I live in Dayton, Ohio, and we have a website that we put all of our uh, live broadcasts on shortly afterwards. And that website is www.spiritualenergy.net. And you're welcome to go there anytime. You can find that on my Facebook wall, Atorialo Yansa. And you can also go to um, YouTube. And there we have a YouTube URL, which you can find on my Facebook wall. And the YouTube um, is under Atorialo Yansa. And um, you can find everything we we talk about there. So we'll begin to take a look this evening. Now we had we had talked quite a bit on the um, the trumpets last week, and I want to go ahead and uh, stay on that. And let's take a look at that eleventh chapter. We'll go backwards just a little bit, and kind of fill in some blanks, but. Uh, for today, for this 11th chapter, I wanted to call it Prophets, Purge the Earth, and Restore the Kingdom. <clears throat> That's the way things are purged. That's the way they're destroyed. That's the way the, the earth was purged in the days of Noah. A prophet built an ark and called his family in and purged the earth. And uh, that's the way it was done in Jesus' day. He... Uh, went to Calvary's Hill and purged the earth. And we know that, again, the earth is to be purged and it's to be by fire. And I know that everybody thinks that means um, everything's going to burn down by fire out here. But uh need to read The Future Home where Brother Branham said it's not a natural fire, it's a spiritual fire. And um, the spiritual fire being um, the Word... And we'll see how that word comes about here today. So, prophets purge the earth and restore the kingdom. And uh, before I get started, everything's okay, Alan? Great. Okay, we saw the eternal day move on the scene and begin to transform and purge our bodies and the earth in Revelations, the 10th chapter. Now, we started out in Revelations 8 where the angel, there was silence in heaven and then an angel came with a censer in his hand and all the prayers of the saints, and he casts fire into the earth and uh, off, of the, off of the golden altar. And we know that was Jesus Christ, the pillar of fire himself, doing those things. And um, then we, we come to that ninth chapter, and we've seen exactly what we've seen in the other um, ways that he revealed himself in the, in the church. First three chapters, it was iniquity and and uh satan sitting on the throne and all sorts of things that happened and the son of man had to purge that in the third chapter and then we seen where uh in the in the sixth chapter the seals opened up and it brought out the iniquity of of the the human uh elements within us and then at the end of that in the seventh chapter um he had to purge us, and we were all seen an innumerable amount of people in white robes, and um, <clears throat> John couldn't even uh, number them. And there was voices and thunders and lightnings, and it was it was the end of of that uh, that that revelation. And then we came into the trumpets, and we seen the seventh seal open. There was total silence, and into the earth came the great angel, Jesus Christ himself, cast the fire, the prayers of the saints, everything into the earth. And in the ninth chapter, we've seen the iniquity 
come out again. So it's just a it's a re- repeat, a constant repeat or a constant set of cycles to help you understand what's going on. So we see that uh, in that eternal day, the tenth chapter begins to open up. If it's finishing up, and the pillar of fire, Jesus Christ returns to the earth with a book in his hand, a book of life at hand for us to take it and eat it up and and uh, take it in and that's in the 10th chapter and it was our uh, it was our our complete redemption in the 10th chapter you know the uh, the redemption plan on Calvary it cleansed the earth but it was supposed to come to a time to where it would cleanse humanity and and Brother Branham told us in Souls in Prison that that 10th chapter was the completion of redemption. He said he couldn't do it all at the cross. He had to wait until everything was uh, finished up at the end of the ages, and then he brought the complete redemption plan. So it was our complete redemption in Revelations 10 when Jesus Christ himself descended, and when that attribute in the pillar of fire opened in us and it began to transform us, our carnality, our intellect, um, all the beasts, the images of the beast nature, the the creeds, the dogmas, the systems, it began to cleanse us. And that's what the pillar of fire is to do, is to take humanity, an attribute which opened up in the earth, and cleanse it, and humanity is Christ himself moving in the earth. Now, we see, uh, we took the book of thunders. That's what it was. It was a book of thunders. The Lamb's book. Or as he said in the seals, a title deed to the earth. An abstract title deed. An abstract title deed means that you have complete ownership and you can do anything with the land that you want to do. You have the ownership of it. And that book that we took and ate in the 10th chapter is and was the title deed to the earth, an abstract deed. And so what we did was we took that title deed and we crowned the lamb, that title deed being son of man, son of God, and uh, and uh, right on down the line, all of the sonships and all of the things that happened from Adam all the way down, we took that book, and we crown Son of Man, Son of God, and Son of David on Sunset Mountain where we all went. Brother Branham said he's seen us all there. And so, you know, someone told me, he said, well, Brother Parnell, uh, at that time you were only in the, in the fourth grade. That's right. My body was sitting right there at the desk in Dayton, Indiana. And Mrs. Copeland was my teacher, and I left there and went to Sunset Mountain and completed what I needed to complete with all the other millions of people, and then I went back and sat down at my desk. My body didn't leave, but we went there. So we see this going on. We crown the Lamb, the people as the Son of Man in the earth. Now the Lamb, remember, is not the guy hanging on Calvary. It's the people that came through all of that torment and all of that persecution, and they became the lamb. And we crowned that and said, it's done everything it's supposed to do, and now our commission is to come back into the earth. So we walked among the candlesticks. We transformed the iniquities. We opened up our nature of humanity, revealed it in four horse riders and four beasts, transforming ourselves into an innumerable people in Revelations, the seventh chapter. And then we cast ourselves into the earth and all the desires within us, we cast it all into the earth and we opened up humanity and it began to transform and it began to transform in the place where the greatest battle has ever fought. And we know that's not battles going out here like Gettysburg and, and Chancellorsville and everything else and and Germany, and and no, that's not the battle. The battle is right here in the mind, and these trumpets were going on in the mind of us. We are the humanity. We are the Christ. We opened up our attribute, and then we began to perfect our attribute that we opened up. So we've seen how that uh, 
we cast ourselves into the earth, the desires within us, open them up at the altar of deity, the golden altar, open it up in the presence of everyone and said, now let's go to battle and let's take these things and let's, let's work on them and let's transform ourselves into perfection, to transform our carnal minds into a spiritual mind of Christ. That's what we wanted to do. And once again, we showed how we have overcome and transformed ourselves to new heaven and new earth. In this 11th chapter, the trumpets were revealed in the area of humanity, inside humanity. You do know that humanity was in the theophany. And then when the theophany chose to break humanity out, it was, it was a, a set of attributes that had not been perfected. And he wanted to take us through choice and we wanted to go through choice to perfect our attributes. So the trumpets were revealed in the area of humanity where the greatest battle ever fought took place. The mighty angel handed us, the mighty angel being the pillar of fire, handed us our part in the book. He handed me my part February 8th, 1954 and said, go fulfill your part in the book. He handed William Branham's part in uh, 1909, April the 6th. He said, go fill your, fulfill your part. And he fulfilled it and finished it up on December the 24th, 1965. We're all handed that book. And when they, when they hand the book, you're going into humanity. The mighty angel hands us our part of the book to fulfill. The individual fulfills, fulfills their part. By transforming their unit, that's my whole unit, body, spirit, and soul, transform the unit, body, soul, and spirit, and the earth fulfills its transformation by purging the earth and humanity. So we're going right down the list, watching how he does that. Humanity is Christ. I've said it for years. Humanity is Christ. He wanted to become humanity. The prophet said the greatest thing that ever happened is when heaven and earth united and hugged and kissed. The greatest thing that ever happened is when the spirit and the flesh came together and was no longer twain but became one flesh. All of these things are going on right now. So humanity is Christ and it will take care of itself. You can see how it's purging itself now. You say, oh my, this is the most unbelievable age, the filthiest age it's ever been. No, this is just the age that the filth is being exposed because humanity is going to deal with it and the consequences of it and the Spirit is leading us to do that. That's what you're seeing today. So we see now the spoken word, it comes and it brings us to a new day. Now let's watch the eighth day open up to our eyes where we can see it ourselves. In another way, which Satan, the processes of intellectualism, and all of those things are transformed again into the renewing of the mind. That's what Paul said. You don't, you don't get another mind. Your mind is the theophany. And you took on an attribute that laid in the theophany, which is the carnal mind. And then when you the theophany and the carnal mind, that attribute comes out, then we begin to perfect it, and by perfecting that, it becomes what Paul said, a spiritual mind in Christ. So, we have this going on. Our intellectualism, our, our everything about us is being transformed into the renewing of the mind. Now, I want to read a something that <clears throat> David said, and I really like it. And David said in Psalms 46 and 1, he said, God is our refuge and strength. And he said, a very present help in trouble. The reason I'm reading these is because I'm going to talk a little bit about that trouble. And I want you to know, David was talking about our day and how the Lord would be our refuge in the time of trouble. Now he goes on, he says, therefore we will not fear though the earth be removed. I mean, think about that. Though the earth be shaken right off of its axis and removed, we shall not be in, in any fear. We know 
the Spirit is leading us through and will take us right on through. Now notice what David says, the Spirit is a refuge. We remain inside the Spirit. When you go to a place of refuge, you go to a fort, they used to, and it was a place of refuge. You go to your home. At the end of the day, it's a place of refuge. And he says here, the Spirit is our refuge. So we're not outside the Spirit. We are in the Spirit all the time. It is our refuge. We remain inside the Spirit all the time. This is what gives us our strength to conquer all these diseases, to conquer all these battles. Everything is going on out here. It gives us our strength to feel satisfied and keep the victory on the inside of us. And then David says, I love this, a very present help in trouble. Now David knew that the Spirit is ever present and even emphasize it, not by saying he's a help, but he says he is a very present help i mean he makes himself a lot of times he's here and he doesn't even make himself known but he's here and then there are times when it becomes a very present help and the spirit reveals itself we might call it a miracle or a sign or a wonder and it's uh it's a normal thing in the spirit now david knew that there's no doubt that the spirit is present with us all the time so you see this, now I want to go to another prophet, see what he had to say in Daniel 12 and 1. He's talking about a time of trouble. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Now, Revelations 10, the people were written in the book. The mighty angel came, distributed it to the seventh messenger, and revealed the names. I thank God my name was in it. And he revealed the name. Now, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life. Some will recognize as they wake up in their dust. This is not talking about a natural resurrection. This is talking about a spiritual thing. And they begin to wake up and they begin to see what's going on. Some of them awake to everlasting life. They catch the revelation. And others, they let that guilt go right on, tormenting them in all of their ways and all of their creeds and dogmas and lies and I'm not good enough and I'm not worthy enough and I'm not this and that and some come to shame forever uh, and, and everlasting contempt now listen to him and they that be wise now we're talking about us they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament you ever seen when the, when the midday when that sun is bright as it can be and there's no cloud in the sky you can't even hardly look at it and they'll shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever so there is a people here who are shining and they are shining bright and they are turning thousands hundreds of thousands to righteousness and they are as stars forever and ever. You know what a star is? It's a messenger. You know what a messenger is? It's a prophet. You wonder what you are? You just read what you are. You are prophets in this day. Now go back to where I started and I said prophets purge the earth. That's exactly right. And that's who we are and we are purging the earth. Now we go on here. David said... He is very present in a time of trouble. And Daniel said that um, he, he is bringing to us Michael the archangel. How to explain that, I, I know exactly what it means. Michael the archangel is a manifestation of Jesus Christ. It's a manifestation of the pillar of fire. All of your archangels are the pillar of fire in battle, like he battled Egypt, and he battled this, one. and your and your uh, cherubims are the pillar of fire in protection. He battles for his body. 
He protects his body. You remember when uh, when Moses and uh, they were disputing over the body of Moses? That was cherubims protecting you and I. It's not the body of Moses himself. It's a it's a symbolic figure of cherubims, the pillar of fire in cherubim form, dividing us and taking care of us and protecting us. It's a pillar of fire in Michael or in the archangel form, Gabriel and some of those, and it's the pillar of fire protecting us in a time of trouble, in a time of battle, in a time of trumpets. And we see this now. It's a very present help. Daniel then speaks and says, Micah the archangel will stand in the time of trouble when it is more trouble than ever seen. That's what he said. And when the books are open, that's what he said, and when the people's names are revealed, that's what Daniel said, and then their purpose and their nature, they will become a wise people, and they will become a people that shine as a brightness and turn many to righteousness, and you are as the stars, the messengers, the prophets. So we see this going on. Now, we know this is happening now as we go into the last chapter, the trumpets in the 11th chapter, and we'll see when we go into here, we're going to see how the old temple comes to its end. We're going to see how that it's measured by prophets and the end comes by fire. And, but maybe not exactly the fire you think of. You know, the lake of fire is not some lake out here down inside the earth somewhere and it ain't up in heaven. The lake of fire is the word purging the people through prophets, through the people of the age that understand their day. We are purging the earth. Now, we will see the carnality of the beast raise its head one last time in the war of the trumpets and how it's defeated and transformed. Moses, the flesh, and Elijah, the spirit, Rise up in resurrection and translation. The two become one. The fire from this uniting of the flesh and spirit, that's you and I, we have the spirit of Moses and Elijah upon us in the 11th chapter, in the 8th day, we're purging the earth, and the way we do it is flesh and spirit become one. They are no longer twain, but they are one, and we are walking as the pillar of fire, as Jesus Christ in the earth, purging all things. And the purging ain't going to be, it's, it's not going to be like, boom, and there it's all purged, and let's all walk out from behind the curtain now. It's nice and easy. And No, no. It is a growing into it. You don't go to heaven. You grow to heaven. And that's what we're doing now. We're growing and understanding who we are, the fire from this uniting of flesh and spirit devours, destroys, and changes the world and its systems and changes the nature and the cosmos, everything about it. And it's going to do it over a period just like it changed from Adam to Noah, from Noah to Jesus, from Jesus to Sunset Mountain or, or the the uh, William Branham, and then from there on out, we just keep going. We've come through Taurus, which was uh, Adam actually came into there somewhere in Cancer, and then Taurus was the age from the garden up until Noah, and Aries was the age from Noah up until Jesus. Pisces was the age from Pentecost or Jesus up until 1997, ending of the church ages, the opening of the seals that ended the Pisces and we've now stepped into Aquarius. So we see a whole lot of destruction and changes for the better going on all the time and moving us further and further from the water covenant to the blood covenant to the spirit covenant and on out into eternity. So it's going on and sometimes it don't look the best, but that doesn't matter. You know, one thing I, I heard today, I was listening to Brother Branham some, and I heard him say to this fella, uh, he said, um, you're, you're healed. And the fellow was blind. And the fellow went back 
He, he still couldn't see. He walked away and went back around and got back in the prayer line in the back. Of course, Brother Branham wasn't paying any attention. And he said, here come that guy again. He said, that guy looked at him. Brother Branham said, what are you doing back up here? He said, I'm still blind. Brother Branham said, what's that got to do with it? <laughs> he had been prayed for. Now you trust for healing. Of course, you know, later I was listening to the story about it. And later he received his sight sitting in a barber's chair and went shouting down the street. But that's what people do is they have a hard time. When you say something's going on, if they don't see it, then they don't believe it. But you got to get past this eyesight, and you got to get into a different eyesight to understand. So here we are. We see the carnality of the beast raise its head one last time. Moses and Elijah come on the scene, uniting a flesh and spirit, and begins the destruction or the changing. Destruction, go to the future home, it just means changing things. Revelations 11, 1. And there was given unto me a rod. There, I'm sorry. There was given unto me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave it out. Don't measure it. It's not finished yet. Leave it out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be tread underfoot forty and two months. You know what forty and two months? Brother Branham told you very plainly what it represents. The Messiah sign. When you hear all the prophets talking about three and a half years or forty-two months, or so many score days, they're talking about the Messiah sign being on the scene. Now we take that, we say, oh, well, that's the tribulation because the Messiah is going to uh, uh, take us away to the wedding supper for three and a half years and the rest of the world is going to be in tribulation. And it's every bit the truth, just not quite like you thought it would be. We are in the wedding supper. We are in the Messiah sign. We are living every bit of that. And the world is in tribulation. And you got the great and terrible day of the Lord going on. So Revelations, he says, don't measure the court, but the temple, take, take the reed like a rod and rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. Measure that, but leave the outside alone, because that's given to the Gentiles. So it shows that that he is moving among the entire world. Now, this is the 11th chapter. He's moving among the entire world. He's moving to in the Gentiles. And at the same time, he's going directly to the Jew. That's what Brother Branham said in the seals. He says, he says, this is what he said. He is now speaking directly to the Jew. That was in 1963. And we think he's, that, that's, that's finished as far as a natural Jew. And right here sets, every one of you and me is the Jew that he's speaking to now. And we are all Gentiles. Abraham was a Gentile. So we see this. Now, I want to say this. A reed like unto a rod. Now, if you look that up and you go back through a lot of the language in Hebrew and Arabic and everything else, it's a man. The reed, a rod, is a man. And he tells him, take this reed, this rod, you, mister, and measure the, measure and, uh, measure the, the temple and measure the altar, and measure all those things. So the reed's like unto a rod, a man t uh, to come and measure, and measurement puts a defined beginning and end to something. You measure your foot, you say the beginning is one inch, the end is 12 inches, 13, or however big you are. That puts a beginning and an end on it. When you measure something, it's finished. Brother Branham said, you don't pull the cloak off of a of a great uh, sculpture, and it's only half done. He said, "You don't measure it up, and you don't judge it, and look at it until it's finished." So we're looking at the 
the old temple, the church age temple, the old way, the body of Jesus, which was a worshipped temple by many, we're looking at all those things going away and it's moved into the body of the people and this temple gets measured and the altar gets measured and it's defined beginning and end to whatsoever is being measured. The rod, iron, remember in the 12th chapter, we'll get there another time, but it was a rod of iron that he done all this measurement with and all this ruling with and iron is the human body. It's the elements of the earth. The rod of iron reveals itself in the 12th chapter, and a reed is always symbolic of humanity. Go back in the Old Testament. They took the weed, a reed, and they spread the blood all over, all over a hyssop weed. That's a reed. That's what it was called. And you take Jesus asked a very simple question about John the Baptist. What did you see? Did you come out to see a reed shaken in the wind? A reed is a type of man, humanity. So we see this reed, this rod, this man, a person in humanity, measuring out and saying, I'll tell you what it is. It's Paul Arenas, Martin Columba, Luther Wesley Branham. And he lined it all up for you so that you could see the beginning and the end of that old temple. Brought it to Sunset Mountain and said, it's a brand new day since I went yonder at the mountain and come back. It's all new to me. That's his own words. So we see this going on. Now the temple of God, the altar, and those that worship therein were measured. This messenger gave us the little book. He had his, had his hands on it. And he goes and measures up the temple. He measures up everything. He looks at the scriptures to be fulfilled throughout this day and all the rest of the days and who the messengers and the stars were and everything else. And then he takes this little book, measures it. The church age existence is measured, opened it to us. And then we ended all of the temple components, but one. There's one temple component left, and that is the court. Remember, he said, don't measure the court. So we're out here on the back side of the book. We're out here on the back side of the Bible. We're out here on the back side of the edge. You say, where are we at, Brother Parnell? We're in the court. <laughs> That's where we're at. And we are resting in the court. He's The court, the outer part of the temple that is for the entire world to receive the gospel. That's what the outer court was for. Anybody could come into the outer court and hear the word of the Lord. And this is for the, the Gentiles, the full gospel. And he said, measure it not. Then it is revealed that it is the time of trouble, time of tribulation. Therefore, Michael stands up for his people and ends the controversy concerning the devil. Well, let me ask you, for any of you, have we ended the concept of the devil? And that's what Michael was doing. He was standing up to end the fight, end the battle of the devil, cast him out, and recast him into something greater, recast him into a livable situation. This devil is nothing but dogmas, creeds, and, and, and all of your thinking and your carnality and everything else. And Michael the archangel stands up in you and begins to cast all of that out of you and he takes on, that's the trouble, that's the time of the tribulation when you're trying to get out of all those things. The temple worship ended. The special groups of people ended. Did you hear me? The special groups of people ended right there at the end of the church ages, 11th chapter, when a prophet measured it up and said, it's finished. And we see this. Now the worshipers ended. And a new day was opening. The eternal day was coming into view for a reason at the end of the trumpets again. The same happening as the church age, the seals age, and now the trumpets age. And all of them, the same Christ in many forms, simultaneous, it's him, and he's just drawing several pictures of himself for us so we can see all the ways in which he brought us victory and Michael, an anointing of Christ, is on the scene in the time of trouble, removing Satan, the carnal thinking, 
the carnality from our minds. So we have the pillar of fire, Michael the archangel, doing battle with the carnality and doing away with it. It's such a great understanding. Everything is finished from that day. Now, let's go on. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. Now, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. So we see this going on all around us. We already know who the two witnesses are. It's Moses and Elijah, and it's not the literal Moses and Elijah. It is the spirit of the flesh and the word coming together. It's you and me. Stop looking for Moses and Elijah to show up in Israel. They showed up in Israel, and Israel is the wife of Christ. Israel is the outer court now, and there's where... Moses and Elijah are showing up in your flesh, convincing your mind of all of these things. Now, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Olive trees always represent the Gentiles, you know that. And the candlesticks always represent the Hebrews. So it's no longer a special group. It all comes together. The number three and a half years always represents the messianic, messianic ministry on the scene. The fullness of time. Did you know that's the messianic ministry? When the fullness is here, he ain't nowhere else. He's here. All of him. Every bit of him is here. And it is, it is the messianic ministry going on, on the scene, Moses and Elijah, are the two witnesses of that ministry, and we know the Old Testament prophets spoke of them many times. The two cherubims that guarded the Garden of Eden, who you think they were? Who guards your flesh and spirit right now? Who guards you from all of this out here? It's the spirit, the pillar of fire, in the attribute of Moses and Elijah living in you. We know the Old Testament prophets spoke of them. The two cherubims guarding the Garden of Eden. The two on Mount Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah come to open up and to guard Jesus Christ himself. The pillar of fire. The on Mount Transfiguration. The two angels that sat at the end of the tomb. One on each end. Moses and Elijah. The spirit of Paul, go to the sealed book. Brother Branham said, Paul, everybody says, we're waiting on the spirit of Elijah. He said, Paul walked out there in the first uh, church age with the spirit of Elijah upon him. Elijah came all the way down through. That's who protected. Moses and Elijah protected the entire body. They didn't come just at the end. And so we see this now, the two angels at the end of the church age womb, the resurrection out of denominationalism. We were given a little book and we took the scroll and began to eat it. And you know who was inside the scroll? Those two angels. We ate that same spirit and we became the prophets walking in the earth today. Now, a lot of people are afraid of that. I'm not afraid of it. I know who I am. And so we see this going on. The scroll brings us those two angels. We ate them out of the hand of the messenger. It came into us for the manifestation of the new day, which is the resurrection. And we're in it now. And he goes on, says in the fifth verse, if any man will hurt them, talking about the spirit of Moses and Elijah in you and me, If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now I looked up that word killed and it, and it is a temporal thing. It's not that you kill and go out of existence. The word comes out of her mouth. And that fire, if you, if you trace it back all the way into the Arabic and Arabic and so forth, it is sulfur and brimstone. That's what the lake of fire is. 
And that's the consuming fire of Hebrews 10. It is, you remember the old sulfur and brimstone, how if you had a cut or a shot on you and they'd pour that in the wound and strike that flint and set it off and it would purge your flesh and keep your spirit alive. And that's what's going on here. They have the power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have the power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as oft as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth, remember the bottomless pit was open, and the beast began to ascend out of the bottomless pit, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottom pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them. We had an inward transformation. We had Moses and Elijah. We had the eating of the book. We had all of those things. And then, all, what did we do? We got rid of the beast nature. But what we didn't do is get rid of the images that the beast had created and that is all of your demons <laughs> all the demons whether it's uh, statues out here political religious uh, or if it's those demons of hatred malice envy strife anger jealousy all kinds of things in you that you hold against people and everything else yeah we we got that inner nature we ate it in the book and now it's got to purge itself and so we see that for a little while this this uh this beast it overcome and it overcame them and shall overcome them and kill them and our enemy was our inner thinking and our carnality we built it in us by the beast of intellectualism carnal mind creating many images in the earth and in humanity we did all of that and then we had all of that in us it's kind of leftover trash, if you want to call it that. And it, 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 it had your, your mind to where, like Brother Branham said, when those seals opened to him, you remember the angel? Brother Branham said that angel told him, said, now when you cast your line out there, he said, don't tell anybody else how to do it. And this is how you do it. And the angel told him. Well, Brother Branham, he, he cast that line out there and, and he, he, uh, got ready to bring it in and, he gave it one great big jerk. He said the line come back and it got tangled up all over him. He said the angel walked around in front of him and said, I told you not to do that. And then the angel disappeared. And Brother Branham said, I stood there for a while. And you know, I got myself untangled. Well, that's what we did for a while. We stood there in that mess. We had a real true gospel. We have a real true angel deals with us. We have all of those things, but we got ourselves in a mess. And then what do we have to do? Just stand there for a while. Brother Branham said, I kept unrolling and undoing that line. He said, after a while, I got myself untangled. Well, I can tell you this. For a long time, I thought that living in William Branham's, the, the folks of the message was a great place to be. And then I thought, that moving forward a little bit further uh, under a, another person was a great place to be. And then I thought the Third Testament was a great place to be. And then I, th and I just kept moving on and moving on and moving on. And you know what? The message that I heard in the beginning, I began to slow but sure untangle everything. And I got it pretty well untangled now. I feel pretty good. I don't have any line all wrapped around me. I don't have any creeds and dogmas. I don't have anybody telling me what to do. I don't, ain't no, ain't no church, uh, deacons and trustees and everybody else telling me I got to sit down and I'm doing too much or you're doing this and that. Ain't nobody doing nothing. My line's untangled. I got out of all of it and I can sit here if I want to every night and express myself to you. So our enemy was the inner thinking of carnality. We built it in us by the beast of intellectualism, creating many images in the earth, all around us, in our earth, and humanity, our education, our degrees, our, our careers, and everything else, and it's all wrapped around us, and we brought famine, <laughs> and we brought pestilence, and we brought clouds without water, 
and we brought blood for drinking. Couldn't even get a good drink of water. We brought plagues to destroy our beast nature. And as soon as you say, yeah, that was the devil. No, that was the Lord. That was the pillar of fire bringing all of those things upon you. Pestilence and flood and, and, and plagues and diseases and everything else bringing it on you. Famine and everything else to get you to where you got rid of all of that stuff. And once you got to that point, we transformed. We changed. We translated into new discoveries. We translated into vibrations and frequencies way above that tangled up mess. The carnality of the bottomless pit, the carnal mind made war against us. And for a while it overcame. We had already slaughtered the inner beast and then our images, the created demons of the systems, started warring against us. And when they started warring against us, it was our minds and our natures and our images that we had to clean up, cleanse out, and overcome. And we have done it. Think of where you've come. Look at look at the unbelievable movement that you have made. I'm sitting here praising you is what I'm doing. I'm telling you that you deserve all of the praise and, and all the things that that happened to you, the good things, the rewards, you deserve it all. You have come through everything and purged your body, made it pure as gold. You came through the fire and come out on the other end. That is a great task. The inner work was finished. The opening of the seals, a new portal. We created all of our images. And you know where they were all at? All of your images, all those things that you thought, you know, I wrote this book and I did that and I preached this and I traveled here and I ran, I ran with William Branham and I ran with J.T. Parnell or Howard Capps or who, whoever it was, we just all, all of those things that we had in our mind, all those interpretations from those men about who we were, you know where they all were at? Whenever we come to the time that the portal was open, they were right there at the door, standing and trying to keep you from going in. All of it, creeds, dogmas, everything, it came right there. Those images were standing at the door to stop us from entering into this new world, which is Christ. Moses and Elijah manifested inwardly at the end of the dispensation and begin to bring fire out of your mouth, and begin to devour all of those images, and you said, okay, I don't need this, and I don't need that. I don't need these chains. I don't need these creeds. I don't need these doctrines. I don't need any of these things. And that was, Moses and Elijah, the pillar of fire, burning up everything inside you, and it will burn humanity in the same manner, and it will purge the earth in the same manner. It will be the words coming out of the prophets. And I'm not talking about big famous prophets. I'm talking about those walking the earth right now. You are prophets. So we see this. And their dead bodies, Moses and Elijah, their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. (laughs) Now everybody told me back in the old day, they're going to lay over there in Jerusalem. (laughs) <laughs> and it, it it says it's spiritually. Did I, did you read it with me? And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritual. It's a spiritual city. It's not Jerusalem. It's not Chicago. It's not wherever you might think it would be. It's a spiritual city, a spiritual called Sodom and Egypt. I've never read about Jerusalem being in Sodom or being in Egypt. And where also our Lord was crucified. So Jesus wasn't crucified in Israel. Jesus wasn't crucified uh, in in, in uh, the Palestine or any of those places. Jesus was crucified in Sodom and Egypt and spiritual deadly, ungodly, dogmas, creeds, and everything else. Jesus was crucified there, and that same crucifixion 
is taking place again. And it's not on Calvary's Hill. It's not on Golgotha. And it's not in Jerusalem. And it's not in Israel. It's right here. It's in your mind. And you do that to yourself. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations, they all, they shouted. They praised they, they, for, for three days and a half. There you go. So the messianic ministry was right in their midst and they weren't even seeing it and they were shouting over something completely different, rejoicing because they had overcome what was tormenting them. What was tormenting you? Dogmas, creeds, and everything else and you were the pillar of fire and that tormented all of those creeds that you carried. Now it goes on. After three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. The resurrection, Moses and Elijah, the messianic sign. Everything is happening right here in the eighth day at the end of the trumpets, the eighth to eleventh through the eleventh chapter. It's all happening right here. And the spirit of God entered into them. Who is them? It's not Moses and Elijah. It's you and me. And we hold within us the attribute of Moses and Elijah. And we overcame all of our creeds and dogmas. You had to, once you see something, you have to die. You have to bury and you have to be resurrected. I'll get into that after we get through with these things and take a good look at how many times we've done it. And so we see this after three days. And it says they, the Spirit of God entered into them and they stood upon their feet. They began to come out with a completely different revelation. And when they came out with that revelation that they got out of a little book from a messenger and began to spit it out, when they did that, great fear fell upon all of them that heard them. And they heard a great voice. Now what did you hear at the end of the third chapter? The voice. What did you hear in the seventh chapter, the voice saying thunders and lightnings and the people was, was innumerable in robes of righteousness. What did you hear in the eleventh chapter right here again? Thunders and lightnings and a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. So that's what the rapture is all about. We ate the book. We conquered our our humanity, all the things in humanity that we needed to perfect, we transformed it. We made it into a new man and a new day. We took the twain, made it one flesh, and the great voice from heaven, from the inner being, remember the kingdom of heaven is in you. The voice came from heaven, from inside you, saying, Come up hither, let's go higher, let's enter higher frequencies, let's do all these things, we're free now, we don't have to stay among all of this materialism, we don't have to stay among all this economics and everything else, we are totally free, let's rise higher and let's keep going and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. Mount Transfiguration, they ascended to heaven in a cloud. Sunset Mountain, we ascended to heaven in a cloud. At the ascension in Acts 1, they ascended into heaven in a cloud. This is us taking on the revelation of Jesus Christ for our day. We don't fly up there. We live it right here. We are in the cloud all the time. It said that, that Peter, James, and John... Moses and Elijah and Jesus were already in the cloud and Peter, James, and John entered the cloud on Mount Transfiguration in great fear. Well, that's what we've done. We went through a death, a burial, and a resurrection. We resurrected and we heard the voice. It was our voice calling us to go higher than all of these things that are out here in the earth. They're all dead. They've all been measured. It's all been finished. It's all been completed. So we see for a period of time, it looked as if the image, the systems of the beasts had prevailed. And we see that period going on since the opening of the seals. Looked like they prevailed, but life was already dead to their systems and to our inner self. We had already changed. 
the world went on with their gifts and their rejoicing and their worshiping. And most of them, they worship in the name of Jesus and they do all kinds of things and they go right on with it. But the whole system was already measured and embedded as the end of an era. It's done. It may take a generation. I don't know how long it will take. But this system is dead. So Moses and Elijah, the Messianic understanding, laid in the streets three and a half days. While the world continued on under the Messianic sign all around us. The Messianic revelation was not allowed to be buried. They left them laying in the streets. Not allowed to be buried in the denominational world. They didn't want it. They, they said, stay away from us. Stay out of it. So they laid dead in the street for three and a half days. The denominational world wouldn't take it in, which is exactly what happened in our day. They didn't want the world, the, the word and the spirit alive in their civilization and in their religious systems. They don't want live ministry. They want to hear a quote. They want to hear, they want to hear something, something, some bishop sent them in a book so they can stand up on a Sunday morning and give it to their people. They want to hear some, some tape or some, they want to hear anything except live ministry where the Christ is moving those civilizations and religious systems continually do that. Then came the resurrection from the tombs of the spiritual world. And the spirit of life began to crack the tombs of those images. It began to break open everything that we thought was God. And it began to lay it all aside. It began to kill it all. It began to recast it. It began to retransform us. And we raised up and stood on our feet again. The messianic ministry was caught up into a greater revelation and a higher frequency and went up in the cloud and the others, they're still here battling. And we're in a cloud and we are enjoying the revelation of Jesus Christ. We went up into a higher vibration. Great fear fell upon those without the understanding. Because if I didn't have this understanding, I'd be afraid right now. Looking at the political system, the religious systems, thinking about my grandchildren and thinking about what could happen to the earth right now and to the world right now with all of these foolish, insane people trying to run the governments and the and everything else. I, I would be fearful, but I'm not afraid at all. I know that the Spirit has taken us into higher frequencies. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven. See, we, we entered that frequency and vibration of joy and peace and love. Do you know that's the top three vibrations? You can't go any higher than joy, peace, and love. If you get that in your system, it's going to make you healthy. It's going to make you, it's going to make you, uh, feel young. It's going to give you a brand new day. It's going to carry you into discoveries and understanding. If you can just give out joy and peace and love and understanding. It's hard to do sometimes. And they heard a voice from heaven. These images of the beast were being broke up by the revelation. That's the voice from heaven. Come up hither. He didn't, he didn't just holler at you. Hey, come up hither. He took everything out of you. The spirit of Elijah Moses, the, the pillar of fire began to break open and remove everything out of you. And that great voice said, come up hither. And we were taken up like Gideon that busted up all of the idols and Israel was delivered like Moses against Egypt, like Elijah against Ahab, like Jesus against the world, like Paul against the Mosaic law and all those people. It all happens. It's a full manifestation. And what has to happen is a period of time where everything gets busted up, broken up, 
and then renovated and transformed and translated into something new. That's what's going on right now. The same voice in Revelations 3 and 21, Revelations 4 and 1, Revelations 7 and 14, Revelations 8 and 1, Revelations 10, 7 to 11, and now Revelations 11 and 12. Same voice showing you many different ways in which you were being fought for and you were fighting to be delivered. The voice cried out from the heavenly dimensions, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Moses, us, we, Moses and Elijah, did exactly what it says. We moved up higher in the great mystery cloud. It's no longer Sunset Mountain. I'm not waiting at Sunset Mountain. It's Sunrise Mountain. That's what's going on now. We are in a brand new day. Rising of the sun. Cries out, what a resurrection this is. What a sunrise this is out of dead denominationalism. He wasn't preaching sunset anymore. He was bringing us sunrise. And we left that, that mountain and the cloud came back into earth, which is us. The cloud is many witnesses. And the cloud came back into earth. We're the witnesses and we are walking in earth. We moved up higher in the great mystery cloud of, of sunrise mountain of Mount Transfiguration, Mount Sinai, we are the great cloud and all the world beheld our ascension. The whole world seen it. You say, well, Brother Parnell, how did they see it? Let me read something to you. This was preached, and I'm about ready to close here. This was preached in the rapture, 1965, William Branham, the rapture. This was his scripture. If you want to know, what he believed the rapture was. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Psalm 27, 1. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire of his temple. Now that's, this is a rapture I'm talking about. I'm not talking about flying out of your shoes. And he goes on, fifth verse, For in the time of trouble, Brother Branham reads Psalms 27, knows the time of trouble is upon us, told us in Christ revealed in his own word, he said, you better get in your ship and you better pull your sails down and you better buckle everything up because it's coming. The world is headed towards great trouble. And that's what we did. Now, he says, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. He's our refuge. Hide me in his pavilion. You want to know where you went to? You didn't fly off somewhere to eat at some table. Right here, you're sitting in the presence of your enemies and eating of a table that he set in your presence. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where did they go? They stood right in the midst of all of that fire and the smell of smoke wasn't even on them because they were hid in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. That's the rapture. That's what he read. Go read it for yourself. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. You say, well, Brother Parno, when's that going to happen? Well, uh, let's see. May May 27th issue, 1963. Uh, great pillar of fire in the form in the head of Christ. And all of the enemies, all of the world, looked at it. And we were hid in his tabernacle. We were hid away. And now mine head shall be lifted up. And it was lifted up over all of the earth. Mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy 
and I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. That's where we're at. If you think you're going to jump in something and go away somewhere, I'm telling you, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be sore angry. Just like those people got angry at Moses and Elijah. You're going to be sore angry because we're not going anywhere. This earth is ours. What we are going to do is change this earth. We are going to change humanity. We are going to change the governments. We are going to change the political systems. We are going to change everything and bring humanity to where Christ, the anointing on the people, is what's walking in the earth. This is a great day. Great day. I want to I want to say this just a couple more things. There there's where we're caught up to in the spirit. His secret tabernacle in the time of trouble. Our head Christ over the mountain and he returned to earth with the commission to rapture humanity into the third coming of Jesus Christ. That's the third coming to set up and establish his kingdom in the earth. Christ establishing his kingdom. You say, well, that hadn't happened yet. I'm going to read you one more thing. In the same hour that this great going away was taking place, there were earthquakes. The cities fell. Earthquakes where men were slain, thousands, and they were affrighted, and they were afraid. The second woe is past. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Listen, 11th chapter, and the seventh angel sounded. It's right in our day. It's going on right now. Everything I just told you is in our day. And when the seventh angel sounded, you want to know what it says? And there were great voices in heaven, great voices in you and me, crying out, great voices in heaven, saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. It did not say the kingdoms of this world will become and the kingdom of the Lord will come. It says the kingdoms of this world and have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. The kingdom is here. Stop looking for where it's coming. It's here. And his mind will continue to grow us into this great kingdom and there's no human being anywhere who's going to be able to fight against it it will just slowly continue to flow through its processes until everything is gone except the kingdom of God once again the eternal day we see it it's wide open the four and twenty elders fall the chakras the twenty four chakras they began to set before, they fell on their faces, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art with us and is to come. We give you power to reign forever. We came together in oneness to worship Jesus Christ, the pillar of fire. Jesus Christ finished his day, and he will be with us, the Jesus, the man Jesus. But the pillar of fire is who we worship. The great pillar of fire, the Father in his kingdom, our 24 chakras and the body aligned and the four beasts completed their victory and we are now in harmony. We understand who we are. What a great day this is. That's your 11th chapter. It ends in the 8th day with all these great things happening. The 3rd chapter ended in the 8th day. The 7th chapter ended in the 8th day. The eleventh chapter ended in the eighth day, and we're going to watch. We're going to see how it ends in the fifteenth chapter, and how it ends in the nineteenth chapter, and how it ends in the twenty-second chapter. It's a great, beautiful thing that he just painted. He painted six beautiful pictures of how we orchestrate the great kingdom taking over the earth. That's what it is. What a day! Many people can't see it. They still can't see it. But that's all right. That doesn't mean it's not here. 
When someone says to you, well, you're just plain foolish. This is not the kingdom of God. It's okay. They are just of those people that get very angry because you've had a resurrection within you of Moses and Elijah. The pillar of fire is our father. That's right, Sister Grace. The pillar of fire is our father. And we have moved into the Father's kingdom. Read Corinthians 15. Jesus submitted and gave up the kingdom to the Father. We're not in sonship anymore. We're living in the Father's kingdom. Love bless you. I hope this has been a great help. And we will start on that 12th chapter the next time we come together. And we will see exactly more about us conquering in victory, in love, in empathy, in all of these different ways, we will see more happening from the 12th to the 15th chapter. Love bless you. Lord Jesus, we come to you. We thank you. We thank you for transforming yourself into a man and walking in the earth and finishing the redemption plan. We do thank you for that. And we thank you for coming back and transforming yourself into a group of people, seven ages long, 2,000 years. And we thank you for that. And we thank you, Pillar of Fire, O oh, Father. We thank you for taking us into this new day, not of sonship, but a new day of the Father, the Father's kingdom, the Father's day. And we are listening, and we will do all that the Father says, that is inside us. Heal us. The Father wants us to be well. The pillar of fire, Jesus Christ, wants us to be well. He wants us to live healthy. He wants us to come through all of these turmoils and trials. He wants us to come through it perfectly on the other side and be able to give testimony of our experiences in a depth that, could never be imagined. We thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Love bless you, and I hope that this was a great help. And we will come back next Tuesday and uh, talk a little further on how Jesus has revealed himself in us and that we are the Christ. Love bless. Well. Better put my glasses on, make sure I'm doing the right thing here.